Happy Earth Day, everyone. Uh, I'm David Wilco, and it's uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you to uh, today's uh, CPRI seminar. Our speaker uh, this afternoon is Jim Salzman. Jim is the Donald Bren Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law with joint appointments at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara and at UCLA Law School. Uh, and is, I believe, the only professor in the UC system to have a distinguished chair in two separate UC institutions, which I think is a, is a reflection of how much in demand he is. Prior to moving to UC Santa Barbara and UCLA, he held a joint appointment within Duke University in the Nicholas School of the Environment and in Duke's Law School. And I think that reflects the very interdisciplinary nature of Jim's research. Uh, because Jim is interested in how law and policy and science all relate to each other. His research has covered a wide array of topics. Um, most recently, he has focused extensively on policies related to drinking water, and he will be talking about that this afternoon. But he's also worked on trade and environmental conflicts, as well as payments for ecosystem services. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, for three years, Jim served uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency's National Drinking Water Advisory Council, the highest such uh, advisory council uh, related to the nation's drinking water, until he was dropped by the current administration, <laughs> which I personally regard as a badge of honor. Uh, he is the author of nine books and over 90 research articles and book chapters related to environmental law, environmental policy, ecosystem services, and drinking water. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome Jim back here after an absence of about eight years. Is that correct? Ladies and gentlemen, Jim Salzman. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, so one thing David didn't mention is that I've known him since I was a high school student. Uh, he's been a, a wonderful mentor over the years, so it's, it's, it's a special pleasure to, um, to be here. So I'm going to talk about, uh, as David mentioned, uh, drinking water issues today, based in part off my book um, and, and research that I've, done, that I've done since then. And I want to start with a story. And the story takes place high in the Andes, in the, the city of Cochabamba. And Cochabamba has challenges that are shared by many uh, large cities in developing countries, and the challenge is drinking water. Right, so population close to a million now, almost half do not have access to treated water. Everyone needs safe water. Right, so you hit this tragic irony where the very poorest in the society have to pay the most for their drinking water because they don't get it from, uh, from pipes, from, from infrastructure. Uh, this has been known for a long time, obviously. Uh, and in the 1980s, the World Bank and other international financial institutions pushed a strategy that was known as structural adjustment and many of you may have heard about this, the basic idea was that the private sector is better placed to provide services in the face of state failure. Right? The government has failed, private sector should step in. We see this today with schools, prisons, etc. Thatcher, Reagan, they were the ones who kind of pushed this originally. And essentially countries like Bolivia were told you're not going to get access to international financing unless you privatize uh, certain public services. Uh, and so uh, Coach, uh, the, this, the, the region of Cochabamba put out a tender, 40-year concession for provision of drinking water and treatment of wastewater. Uh, and the, um, the contract was won by a consortium called Aguas del Tunari. It really was Bechtel with a local, a local partner. There's a lot of debate over what happened once the contract was signed. Some people say the price of water went up 10%, some say 20%. Where there's no debate is that there were riots throughout the region. And the riots went on for several months. A number of people were killed. And after three months, the contract was canceled. Right? Aguas del Tenari and Bechtel were kicked out. Um, while this was going on, there was a group of grassroots organizations that got together, and they published something they called the Cochabamba Declaration. Now, you can read this yourself, but the fundamental point they're making 
is that water should be treated as a right, access to drinking water, not as a commodity. And what's interesting is if you contrast this with a declaration that was published six years earlier by the world's governments at an international meeting in Dublin, something called the Dublin Declaration, they said the exact opposite. Right? They said that water is fundamentally a commodity and in fact must be treated as a commodity because if something valuable is free, you overuse it. And so what we have uh, that I find interesting is uh, this intense conflict. So for those of you who follow the anti-globalization discourse, Cochabamba is a big name, right? Cochabamba resonates in the anti-globalization movement. And what I find fascinating is that events in a city that many folks have never heard of in the anti-globalization movement has taken on the meaning of the storming of the Bastille, right? It, and, and so the, what, what I got interested in originally about this project was which is it? Is water a commodity uh, that to be mediated by markets or is it a right that basically should be, should be guaranteed by governments? Um, and it led, to, it led to a larger project, the book, and sort of to keep some dramatic tension throughout, throughout this, this lecture, I want to sort of pose a question for the audience now that I'll get to at the end. Uh, and that is, I'm going to ask you what the oldest example is for the sale of bottled water. Just think about that. All right, so we'll put that to the side. So what I got interested in with, with this project, uh, starting off, was how far, what does history tell us right, about this, this conflict, over essentially who gets to drink? Right? If water is mediated by markets, that tells you one thing. If it's mediated by, by, as a human right, it's quite another. Uh, and so I basically went back as far as I could. You know, what do we know about drinking water in terms of, in terms of hu uh, human history going back as far as we can? And a few things become uh, evident very quickly. The first is that any time you find an archaeological dig for a large settlement, you find sophisticated water technology for that time which makes sense, right? You're not going to have a settled community unless you have a steady support source of, of safe water. Um, and so you find at Machu Picchu, high in, uh, in the Andes, in Peru, very sophisticated um, channels to carry the water. Over here uh, is the driest place on Earth. This is a cistern at Masada, right, above the Dead Sea. Anyone know where this is? Right, so this is underneath Constantinople, underneath Istanbul. It's a giant cistern. The oldest example we have for the management of drinking water uh, is what's called a kanat, Q-A-N-A-T. This is in Jordan. You find them throughout aspects of the Middle East. This is about 3,500, 4,000 years old, right? So you can find examples really in any culture and a culture you look. But I'm a, as David said, I'm a law professor by training, law professor and engineer. Um, and so I was trying to think, how are we going to find out sort of historically how water was regarded? And I figured, well, you have to find a culture that had written records, that lived in an arid place, and that had a lot of rules, right? And that is the wandering Jews to a T. Uh, and so you look in the Torah, you look in the Old Testament, and it turns out that there actually are very clear rules about drinking water. Uh, and it's clear from the outset that drinking water is not viewed as a commodity. And the reason is that it's given by God, right? So if, if, if I don't know, if God gives you something, you don't put it on eBay, right? That, that's sacrilegious. <laughs> And it's the same thing with drinking water. Uh, and so it was, not, it was not a marketed good. But there was an interesting aspect that I, that I didn't expect. And that was that if you have, there's a rule that says if you put labor in to secure water, for instance, digging a well, then it's not an open access resource. You actually can exclude people from that, um, from that source of water. But even that is subject to something known as the right of thirst. And the right of thirst basically said that if there's an outside party uh, who was desperate in need of water, they're dying of thirst, they get priority within your community over the other, the other uses. And a guy called John Rawls, a very famous legal philosopher, would have seen this coming. He, he had this experiment called the veil of ignorance. Right? Where it basically says, if you are the lawmaker and you don't know who you're going to be, right? rich, poor, uh, et cetera, um, dying of thirst, not dying of thirst, what kind of rules would you want? This is known as a Rawlsian rule because you could be that person who's dying of thirst, who's not part of that tribe, and you want access to the water. Um, turns out that this was a, a very common rule. So this is from the Quran, right? Very similar notion where sharing water is seen as a holy duty. Anyone know where this photo is, is from? Lawrence of Arabia, classic film, right? This is where they're, they're dying of thirst in the desert. They find a well, Omar Sharif comes out of shimmering heat and, and, and kills, um, kills uh, Peter O'Toole's Lawrence Arabia's guide. That is not the right of thirst, right? Uh, it's a good movie, but it's, it's not the right of thirst. Um, 
if you look at other societies, you get some interesting twists. So in traditional Hindu, traditional Hindu society, traditional Hindu law, the concern is not simply physical pollution of the water, but metaphysical pollution. So every caste in traditional Hindu society has its own water source because you don't want to be spiritually polluted by drinking water from a lower caste. Um, even there, they're sharing. And of course, we, have, we had this in, in many parts of the United States for long periods of time with segregation, right? So this picture was taken from the uh, front of the, of the Grantham County Courthouse in North Carolina, right? And it was a similar kind of sense of a metaphysical, spiritual pollution by having segregated, segregated fountains. And if you look around the world, it turns out that the right of thirst exists everywhere, right, with indigenous cultures. It's almost a universal, a universal rule. And what's interesting is it's got some common features. So again, in indigenous ancient cultures, even those continuing today, water is not viewed as a commodity at all, right? And it's an open access commodity. Uh, you can close it, but even in times of need, there, there's this right of thirst. And this is a very robust system, right? This has endured in societies for thousands of years. So the question then becomes, so where do we start to see water as a commodity? And the answer to that really is where you look for all things water in ancient times, which is Rome. All right? The Romans really understood water. Uh, and I find remarkable that their, their engineering not only you know, is, 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 is structurally sound today, it's beautiful. Right? They really knew what they were doing. Uh, and those of you who travel in Italy know that Italian culture is carried through. There's a real love for water. And basically, any village you go to in Italy, there'll be some kind of water feature. Uh, that, that you'll come across. So as you know, uh, Rome's water was brought in through aqueducts, interestingly not for drinking water. The original purpose of the aqueducts was to bring in the other, was basically to, to um, assist in the other great Roman innovation, which was sewage. Right? So one of Rome's great innovations was the cloaca maxima, the fact that they had these giant sewers to wash away the waste. And to wash away the waste, you've got to bring a lot of water in. Later, they bring in an aqueduct that's dedicated to drinking water. Uh, that was known as the Marcia. Um, and for most Romans, uh, water was basically viewed as a right. It was not viewed as a commodity, and it was through what's called a locus. So this is an etching of a locus right here. Right? Basically, the water is pouring. And you're limited, essentially, by how much you can carry. Uh, this is um, a, a photo of Herculaneum. Right? This was buried by Vesuvius. And you can see a locus right here. You can see one about 100 yards further up. So that's how most Romans, in this case, the Politans, Neapolitans, um, or Herculaneums, I guess, uh, got, their, um, got their water. But here's where things start to get interesting. You also could get water privately. So 40% of this aqueduct went to private homes. Uh, and how did they pay? Well, there were no spigots back in ancient Rome turning water on and off. It was free flowing. Um, the Home Depot do-it-yourself guide survived. Right? So future generations would know enormous amount about how we change light bulbs and such. We know enormous amount about Roman water engineering. And Frontinus complained about this thing he called puncturing. So puncturing occurred when at the dead of night, these wealthy families would send their slaves out. They would lift up the flagstones and they would puncture the water mains and surreptitiously bring the water into their villa. Um, how could they puncture the water mains? Well, the water mains were made out of what? Lead, right? Plumbum. And so it's a soft metal. Um, and we know it's a big deal because Frontinus complains about it. He also says that there was a charge or a fine of 100,000 sesterces if you were caught. Now, Google Exchange does not tell us how many dollars 100,000 sesterces is, but you've got to figure 100,000 of most anything is something, right? So this actually is sort of modern day puncturing. This was taken in Lagos, Nigeria. Anyone know what they're puncturing here? It's electricity, right? Do not do this at home. But the, the practice continues. And so what you've got is, a, is, I think, quite a sophisticated cross-subsidization strategy in ancient Rome where the government pays for the infrastructure uh, and then the vectical pays for the operation and the maintenance. And we have a similar structure in a lot, of, um, a lot of water systems today. And so what I find fascinating is the nature of water in Rome depended on how you got it. If you got the water from the locus, you got it as of right. And if you got it from the vectical, it was a private good. It also had a political salience, though, as well. So after Augustus became emperor, uh, he dramatically increased the number of locusts and made them much more ornate. So for those of you who remember your Roman history, Augustus was the first Roman dictator. He took power after Julius Caesar. 
And he basically was taking something out of the playbook uh, of dictators ever since. So when you have totalitarian dictators, what do they tend to do? They tend to have gigantic public works projects and put their face on it uh, and say, here's your train station, your football stadium, whatever, your highway, thanks to your ruler. So it's literally water in the name of your ruler. Uh, and that's exactly what Augustus did. It justified the benefits of the regime change. So in Rome, you've got water as both a right and a private good. So where do we see water as a private good entirely? Well, um, we'll get there in a sec. But I, I, I should note here that after, after the fall of Rome, um, water was not a drink of choice at all, right? So most, most, um, most European cultures, except for a few monasteries, really avoided water for, for, for good reason. This is a wonderful uh, passage from a history that was done, basically saying only the truly poor people who had absolutely no choice drank water. So you may be surprised to hear that the pilgrims, the second building that was constructed uh, by the pilgrims was a brewery. Right? And this is not because they were having keg, you know, keg parties on Saturday night. They didn't trust the water. Right? The way they knew to have safe drinks was to have this sort of very weak, very weak beer. So as I said, so where do you see water uh, purely as an economic good? And that's where you can buy anything. Right? That's Manhattan. Right? Is where we can see water sort of as, as an economic good. As you know, the story of the Dutch buying Manhattan Island from the Native Americans. Um, the Dutch build a fort. Uh, they also uh, put in a few wells, but really not, not a lot of wells. Where they get most of their water is from a, a basically a pond. Called, they called it Calhoc, later became known as a Collect. It's about 32nd and Broadway, if you, if you look at New York today. Um, and you know, the, the, the outpost of New Amsterdam was, was, was getting bigger, and the, the Collect, the Calhoc, was getting polluted. And so the people living uh, in the town go to Peter Stuyvesant and say, hey, you know, we need some funds to dig these deep wells. Stuyvesant says, shut up, go back to trading beaver pelts. You know, we're, we're a business, not a charity. The British come steaming up the Hudson, not steaming, come sailing up the Hudson. The Dutch run into their fort. They close the gate. They turn around. They think for a moment. And then they open the gate and surrender because they have no wells in the fort. So the British come in, and they change it to New York. And they dig a few wells, but frankly, not a lot. And so they continue into the 18th century to rely on the collect. And at this point, New York's a big city, and the collect really is awful. So one of the papers at the time called the collect a very sink and common sewer. There was a Swedish botanist, a guy called Peter Kalm, who wrote a very well-known travelogue of his, his voyages in the colonies in the 1740s. And he had a line that Rodney Dangerfield would have loved. He said, the drinking water in New York is so bad that horses from out of town refuse to drink it. <laughs> right? So it's a problem. So what happens? What happens is you get a private, totally private trade called tea water. And so these entrepreneurs basically sunk deep wells, and they would pump up water every morning into these big barrels that would go up and down the streets of Manhattan, and they would sell the water. This is fine if you're wealthy. It's not fine if you're poor. It's also not fine if you're trying to fight fires. Uh, and so the city realizes this. And there's an initiative to actually create a citywide public water system. It would have been the first in the United States. Not even the United States, it would have been the first in the, in the New World, the British colonies. And they actually printed money, right, called Waterworks Money. There's an example of it up there. So they're going to have aqueducts all over the city, early kind of steam engine. It's brilliant, except for the timing. So they start building in 1774, and the very first city that the British occupy in the Revolutionary War is, in fact, New York. So they destroy the waterworks. So after the war, um, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, they all start putting in public water systems. New York does nothing, and there's increasing pressure to do this. And so now the story takes an extremely strange turn, which is the Broadway stars Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton join together. Uh, and with a few other people, they create something called the Manhattan Company. And the idea is to provide a private company to provide drinking water, pure and wholesome water, to the city of New York. Aaron Burr goes up to Albany and persuades the legislature to give the Manhattan Company a monopoly uh, for the provision of pure and wholesome water in Manhattan and the ability to raise $2 million uh, in, in capital. So one of the things that, Manha that, Manhattan, that, Ale that Hamilton, the musical, got right is that Burr was a scoundrel. Right? So Burr had absolutely no intention of providing pure and wholesome water. What Burr wanted was the ability to raise $2 million without the strictures of a bank charter. So Burr takes almost all the money and lends it out at interest. He takes the remaining money to basically pipe in more water from the collect instead of the Bronx River, which he had talked about. Um, and after a, few, after a few years, they become the Chase Manhattan Company. They later drop the company, and they are actually the Chase Manhattan Bank. 
So if you look at the cross, if you look at the logo for Chase Bank, it's the cross section of a wooden water pipe. Uh, and they continued to pump water into the 1920s because they were afraid they would lose their corporate charter. This is a true story. Everything else I've made up. But this, <laughs> this is accurate, right? So it's a disaster, absolute disaster. Um, and there are fires, cholera outbreaks. And finally, in the 1830s, the city and state finally step in and say, that's it. And that's where you get the Croton Reservoir and, and the, the, the reservoir in Central Park. Um, and so essentially, the story of New York really is the story of privatization until complete failure. And the state has to step in to fix it. But even then, you get free drinking water, right? So the, the Croton Street hydrants, Aqua Nomine Cesar, um, there wasn't as much water pressure in hydrants as there is today. And so if you wanted to, you could literally just open a hydrant to get drinking water. That becomes, becomes unnecessary after about the 1850s, because at that point, water is routinely brought into buildings, not for drinking water, but for this newfangled thing called the water closet. All right, so again, it's actually sanitation that drives a lot of the water infrastructure in the city, not, not the drinking water. Now, I could have told you similar histories in other, in other cities. They, they all follow kind of a similar pattern where this, the, the, the basically government, public, public um, officials finally step in. But there's a related question I want to spend a little time talking about, because even if you can get access to water, you need to ensure the water is safe to drink. And when I was writing the book, conceptually, this was by far the most difficult uh, issue that I, that I grappled with, because safe drinking water is actually quite a complicated concept. I mean, if we were to go back in a time machine 150 years to Victorian England, and they said, have a drink of water, you know, you'd say, thank you very much, <laughs> right? Uh, we'd say it's unsafe, and yet they say, what are you talking about? It's perfectly safe, right? And it may be 100 years from now, same experiment would happen, people from the future wouldn't drink our water, right? What is it about water that makes it safe or unsafe? And I think the answer lies in your notion of what causes disease, right? And, you know, based on your model of what caused disease, we wouldn't drink water 150 years ago because we're concerned about germs, which they didn't even know. They didn't, you know, a few of them. It was, it was, a, it was a rising theory, but it wasn't accepted. The main theory at that point, which had been the, the, the sort of the main theory of disease for a thousand years, was the miasmatic theory, the idea that there were poisonous airs. Uh, and you, got, you could get sick drinking water, but you got really sick by drinking bad air. So malaria is quite literally bad air, right? Um, and so how, how did drinking water play a part in this? So this is a story that some of you may know, but if you don't, um, this, is, this is probably the, the most interesting part of the whole, the whole presentation. A guy called John Snow is a Yorkshireman, self-made man. Um, he uh, was a doctor, and he was convinced that cholera, which was the scourge of Europe at the time, was actually a waterborne disease. And this was so outrageous that the Lancet, which is, was the premier and still is a premier medical journal, they actually denounced him as a quack in the 1830s for, for, for pushing this stupid idea. Um, so Snow was trying to figure out some way to, to, have this, to, have, to prove his theory. He actually made his name because he was one of the first to use anesthesia, uh, to use anesthesia for childbirth. He, uh, he actually delivered Queen Victoria's youngest child using, uh, using anesthesia, which fortunately turned out well. Um, so 1854, there is an outbreak of cholera in London. And Snow makes use of a law that had been passed about 10 years earlier that required the, the city to, to actually have public records of the name of the person who died, cause of death, age, and address. Before that, it had been literally like Monty Python's Bring Out Your Dead. You know, when you died, you were just gone, right? Um, so Snow basically puts this together, and he has this blinding insight where he actually maps it. This is the very first time, this really is the creation of public health, right? This had never, this had never been done before. This is a very famous map in the history, very famous document in the history of science. It's called the ghost map. Uh, and you can see maybe a sort of black circle right in the middle that says pump. And Snow was trying to show that all the outbreaks were centered around a pump called the Soho pump. But he had a problem. And the problem was there were two outbreaks of cholera at the exact same time, one about nine miles away and one about 13 miles away. And Snow was a very careful researcher, so he didn't just say, well, my theory's wrong. He went to visit the son nine miles away, and he was offering his condolences. And the son said, you know, my mom used to live in Soho, and she so loved the water there that she would send her servant once a week to get water from the Soho pump. And Snow says, interesting, anything else? Anything else happened recently? And he says, yes, my poor aunt, she died of cholera too. Uh, and she came to visit just last week. She was the one, it turned out, who had died 13 miles away. So this is the very first example, literally, of epidemiology. 
And it's so central to the story of epidemiology that the symbol for the International Society of Epidemiology is a pump handle uh, out, of, out of homage to, um, to the snow story. In the US, we have a related problem, right? So the germ theory is not really caught on yet uh, in the, the, public's, the public mind. So this is, uh, there's a problem because in the US, the way you got public water uh, until about the teens, when you got drinking fountains, uh, was you would have a cup that was basically chained to a faucet. Now, if you care about germs, this is a bad idea. So the question is, how do you change, how do you change the public perception? So this was a brochure from the Minnesota State Board of Health. Right? And the message, I think, is pretty clear, which is <laughs> if you'd like to die, this is a good way to do that. Um, there, in fact, was an NGO that was created called the Cup Campaigner, and their sole mission was to eliminate the public drinking cup. Right? And again, I think the message here is, is pretty clear. Right? If you'd like to join me in Hades, have a sip, my dear. Uh, and so if you're an entrepreneur, this presents an interesting challenge. Right? Because how do you replace a chain drinking water cup, well, you want a cup that is inexpensive and that's disposable, maybe something like the Dixie cup. So this actually is the patent drawing for the Dixie cup, which occurs at exactly this moment to fill exactly this market, this market niche. The next development turns out to be the bubbler, right? First developed by a janitor for the Berkeley public school system, uh, Berkeley, California. And it was called a bubbler because, as you can see, there was a ball and the, the water bubbled out over the top. So um, the, the, the big shift that happens in the US, uh, it really doesn't take place until the teens and after that, which is the advent of chlorination. Right? That's the single most important advent really in the history of safe drinking water. But w waterborne diseases still kill people. So Wilbur Wright, right, the aviation brother, he died of a waterborne disease in the 20s. Right? It was not unusual for people to die from those diseases. Um, so the challenge is that the, the federal government by the teens realizes that chlorination uh, really is going to provide a lot of safe drinking water, but they don't have federal authority to require chlorination throughout the country. The Commerce Clause is very strictly regarded at that time, but they're clever. And what they do is they basically create standards for water for common carriers. So basically, if, you, if, if, if a train, if a boat, um, if a bus goes through your town and you provide water to them, the water must be chlorinated. And so essentially what they do is they basically sort of bootstrap the fact that these common carriers are going all over the country to essentially force those communities to chlorinate their water. Otherwise, you're not allowed to put water into the, into the common carriers. Um, there are public standards that are created over time, but they, they, they're, they're small and they're not really enforced uh, at all. So the Senate, um, uh, asked the Public Health Service for a study, and the Public Health Service very cleverly does these studies in the states of all the most powerful senators. Uh, and they, they present the results. So Scoop Jackson was a major senator from Washington State. Um, and what they found was, was scary, right? Eight million people are drinking potentially dangerous water. And this leads the Senate and finally Congress to introduce legislation. So it started in 1971. And what's interesting is the, the original law was called the Pure Drinking Water Act. Right? Now, that might have been because the Pure Food and Drug Act was the basis for the FDA. It eventually becomes the Safe Drinking Water Act. And conceptually, that's important because our water is not pure. Right? It's, it's a risk issue. And so it's safe, but it's not pure. Eventually, all kinds of issues going on. If this is more legal audience, I'd go into more, more, more detail on here. But there are a lot of different aspects of what the law, the law could look like. Finally, uh, the bill comes out, Safe Drinking Water Act, and it's signed by Gerald Ford. Nixon refused to sign it. Right, he basically, environmentalists had not supported him in the 1972 campaign, so he had all kinds of choice words in his tapes for environmentalists. Uh, but Ford does. It's one of the first things he does. Um, let's, let me skip that. Okay, so which leads us to, to today. Um, and Reader's Digest just a few years ago had an issue, said, how safe is our water? Right? And up here, I'm not sure you can read it. It says, may contain rocket fuel, birth control pills, arsenic, and more shocking ingredients. All right, so two things. First of all, when a magazine asks you how safe is our water, the answer probably is not very, right? That's kind of the impl implication of the, of the cover. The second is what, they've got, what they say up here is both true and, and misleading, which we can talk about a bit. I know there are a lot of engineers in the audience. This is parts per billion, parts per trillion, right? And the question becomes, well, how safe is safe, right? From epidemiological terms, we frankly just don't know. Uh, there hasn't been enough study of, of synergies and such. 
Um, but the fact is uh, that we have pharmaceuticals, we have, of, of drugs in all of our water, right? Whether it's tap water or bottled water, right? And there have been all kinds of studies that have been showing this. Why is that? Well, part of it is that people dispose of drugs, to, you know, they flush them down the toilet. Part of it is that we don't completely metabolize the drugs that we do take, right? So all the water we're drinking contains drugs. Um, is that a good thing? No. Uh, is that a dangerous thing? Experts tell us probably not, uh, but they don't really know, right? And it's, it's, it's sort of a cost question. How much are we willing to take out of the, uh, to take out of the water? Fracking has raised all kinds of issues uh, as well. In California, where I live, it's particularly important or, or, or pressing because it, it's, there's so much seismic activity, it's very easy uh, to contaminate the, um, the aquifers. And, and we'll have some time for, for Q&A afterwards if you want to talk a bit about that. And then Flint. Right, so the first edition of my book came out in 2012, um, and it, it did well. It actually was sold in a few airport bookstores, which for me is my measure, my measure of success. Um, I took some photos, um, which I, it's not that pathetic, I don't think. Um, so the, um, but then Flint happened in 2000, 2015, basically. Um, and it really is, is his, I think it's the most important single event in the history of, of drinking water in the United States. If you say Flint, people know what you're talking about. And it's, it's a very disturbing incident. We can talk about it more in Q&A, but it's disturbing to me um, for, for three reasons. The first is the way the Safe Drinking Water Act is designed, you have triple fail-safe, right? The local government is supposed to operate the, drink, the drinking water treatment. The state is supposed to make sure they're doing that. And the EPA, the feds, are supposed to make sure everyone's doing it right. And in Flint, you had triple failure. Locals didn't do it. The state was even worse. They actually lied about it and cherry-picked the data. And the EPA was unwilling to intervene because they didn't want to be seen as sort of overstepping, overstepping their bounds. That's disturbing. It's also disturbing because this never would have happened in a, in a wealthy suburb of Detroit. Right? This would never have happened in Gross Point. There were people at Flint who said, hey, this is what's going on. And they were exactly right, and they were ignored. Right? This is a classic example of environmental justice. That's disturbing. The last reason it's disturbing is that I'm, I'm, I'm as close to a drinking water expert as you'll find, except for a few people in this room. But uh, I spent a lot of time focusing on drinking water. I don't know that my drinking water is safe for my tap. Right? I don't have it tested. I trust the local utility to do that for me. Um, after Flint, you know, a lot of people are asking, and I think fairly, how safe is the drinking water? Can we trust the utility to, to actually do what they say they're doing? Uh, and the, the impact of Flint on sort of public credibility has been enormous. And it's going to take a long time, I think, to, to regain the confidence. Um, the, where I want to end, though, is where I think the real challenges for drinking water are in terms of, of human well-being. I mean, notwithstanding the problems of Flint, notwithstanding that there are communities in the Central Valley that can't drink, that don't get safe drinking water, by and large, over 99% of Americans have access to safe drinking water. That is not the case uh, in much of the developing world. I'm sure many of you have traveled there. Um, these numbers obviously are very rough, right? But, you know, uh, almost 2 billion people don't have access to treated water. Obviously, that's related to lack of sanitation. And for development economists, this is a kicker, which is half of the developing world's population is going to be sick at some point or multiple points. You think about lost productivity, that has enormous implications. Um, this has been known for a long time. Right, so one of the Millennium Development Goals set in 2000 was to ad address, increase access to safe drinking water. Uh, there was good progress on that. They have now changed this. The Sustainable Development Goals are, are much more aspirational. They say by 2030, everyone will have safe drinking water. That won't happen, but it's good to move, to move closer toward that. The, the question is how. And so when I give these talks, I, I like to say that you should take everything you assume about drinking water in the US and turn it on its head. Right, so in the US, I'm not concerned about quality, notwithstanding Flint and some other places. I have confidence that the water I drink out of my tap is, is safe to drink. I'm not at all concerned about quantity, right? When I lived in Durham, people would use hoses to water down their sidewalks, a practice I still don't understand, but which is surprisingly popular uh, in Durham. Uh, but you use drinking water right for your toilets, for your radiator, it's all treated, and it's, it's, it's cheap. Um, moreover, if there's a problem, it's not my problem, right? I call the water utility, I say fix this, uh, and they do. In the developing world, none of that is true, right? And I, I'm, I'm talking in, in, in generality, obviously. Um, you know, when you travel in developing world, in the developing countries, you drink bottled water, by and large. Um, 
because you're concerned about quality. Quantity, oftentimes, for the people who live there is limited by how much they can carry. Um, and it's an individual responsibility. But when I say it's an individual responsibility, that's a bit, that's a bit misleading. Right? So if you take a careful look at this slide, um, you'll notice something. And the something is that there are no men in that slide. Right? It turns out that not universally, but in most societies, in most developing countries, the responsibility for water collection falls on girls and women. Uh, and there are all kinds of studies about this, 90 minutes per day in East Africa, two hours, two and a half hours per day in other, in other communities. And if you talk to a development economist and you say, what's the single thing we can do that will most improve quality of life quickly um, from an economic perspective? And they will say, bring in safe drinking water. Because it essentially frees up half the population to do much more productive things than basically being worried about getting water every day. Um, I was in India a few months ago. And this is, this is a university. You see people getting water all the time. Uh, and it's always women. Um, and so this obviously is a big, is a big challenge. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, people need safe drinking water, right? They're not going to go without. And so because there's very rarely infrastructure uh, for, many of these, for many of these populations, they have to purchase water from vendors, and it's much more expensive. Uh, so again, when I was in India, so this basically was selling pure and safe refrigerated water. They say it's reverse osmosis. Um, and it's about one and a half cents per, per, per glass. This is basically a private sector answer. Uh, to the problem of, of safe drinking water in, um, in Delhi. And so it's this situation that led to where we started, right? which was the rise for calls for privatization, because the assumption was the state had failed. Right? The public was not getting safe drinking water. And so whoever does these things, I don't know who names decades, but in 1980s apparently were the international drinking water supply and sanitation decade. Um, and the idea essentially was the way to deal with this is to bring in the private sector. They have greater access to capital. They care more about customer service. They'll solve the problem. Um, and if you had invested in Leonez Dezo, Vivendi, um, Suez, um, you would have made a lot of money. Right? There's been an increasing privatization uh, over the last few decades. Now, I should say privatization takes a lot of different forms. Right? There's no single, single strategy for privatization. Um, and there have been success stories and there have been failures, right? It's been a very mixed, very mixed record. But it's definitely on the increase. What's interesting is that there's also been pushback. And in particular, there's been pushback um, from folks like Maude Barlow and others who have pushed for a human right to water. So the General Assembly actually passed a resolution back in 2015 that said there is a human right to water. Right? And it's interesting just to look at the text to see what they're getting at. So what is the human right to water? They say, well, everyone is entitled to sufficient, so that's quantity, safe, quality, acceptable, social, physically accessible, not too far away. And here's what's interesting, and affordable. Right? So the right to water is not saying water should be free. They're saying it's affordable. But there's a tension, because they then go on to say water should be treated as a social and cultural good, not primarily as an economic good. And obviously, there's a bit of a conflict. Right? If it's priced as an economic good, that's one thing. If it's affordable, sort of what does that mean? Um, I had a very interesting conversation with Maude Barlow a few years ago. She's really been the one pushing, pushing this campaign. And I came up to her after a talk, and I said, obviously, you don't think that just because the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution that, boom, you know, things are going to change. And she said, of course not. And the point she made I thought was very, very insightful. And she, these aren't her exact words, but the point she was getting at essentially was to say, when we talk about slavery today, we don't say, you know, slavery is a bad idea because it's economically inefficient way to allocate labor resources. Right? What we say is slavery is an affront to human dignity. Right? It is, there's a human right not to be enslaved. And governments have to make sure that populations are not enslaved. She wants to basically shift the debate over drinking water so it's operating in the same, in the same sphere. Right? Where you don't say, you know, we should have public provision of water because it's more efficient. But instead saying, Access to safe drinking water is a fundamental right that governments must provide. She's trying to basically change the nature, the nature of the discussion, the nature of the rhetoric. And so what we're left with then, uh, sort of to bring, this, to bring this full circle, is there really is, I think, a, a deep chasm in how we think about water in different parts, different societies around the world. Is it primarily a social cultural good or is it primarily an economic good? Should it be mediated by markets or guaranteed by rights? What's the proper balance between public, public and private provision? So if, if I were to give you a few take-home messages, here, here are the ones that I think that are key. 
The first one is the debate very much has been markets versus rights. Um, that's ahistorical, right? The idea of water as a right goes back thousands of years. The idea of water through markets goes back thousands of years. And oftentimes it's been a hybrid, right? So this notion of markets versus rights really is a false, is a false dichotomy. Um, the second point, and I learned this when I, Carol Rose, who's a very famous property law professor, taught me, taught me uh, natural resources law, and she made, I thought, a very, a very wise point, which was that the way to understand uh, natural resources law is to understand the natures of the resource and to manage for each of those specifically. And water is a very complex resource, right? It's heavy, you gotta move it. So here's a, a stat for you, the state of California 18% of the electricity consumed in the state of California is used to move water, right? Basically one in five kilowatt hours is dedicated to moving water somewhere in the state. Um, obviously cultural aspects, social marker, politics and price good. And you can, if you look back at the Romans, they understood this, right? One reason the Romans were so good at managing water is they managed the different natures of water. They could move it around to the aqueducts, uh, they could have a so, uh, the social meaning through the locus where you could join, the vectical made it priced good, and Augustus certainly understood the political salience uh, of drinking water. So what happened in Cochabamba? What happened in Cochabamba is they only focused on the price. Right? And the reason people were in the streets was not because the price went up. People were used to paying for water. The reason they went to the, the streets was that while this was going on, while they were basically putting out the tender, the parliament uh, for Bolivia, National Assembly, they passed a law that forbade the private collection of water. In order to get water, you had to have a license, you had to have a permit. And essentially what they did is the, the, the government took what had been a public good and basically enclosed it, right? Made it a good that people didn't have access to. And that changed fundamentally no, people's notion of property and property rights. That's what got them out into the streets. All right, well, there's, there's more I could say, but I'm going to, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn quickly to this question, which is, which is the other sort of the, the trivia part. So any ideas for the, the oldest sale of bottled water? It goes way before Perrier. <laughs> now what I'm looking for actually is the actual market. What was the market and when was the market? And I can give you a hint if you want. All right, want a hint? Chaucer. Not beer. Holy water. Holy water, right. So it turns out that there are very few things that are weirder than water coming out of a rock, right? And so for forever, basically, cultures that have natural springs have had these metaphysical creation stories. It was a pan or a sprite or something that happened there. The early Christian missionaries knew this. And when they would basically come to new territory, they would take those stories and they would change them. It would be Saint so-and-so. Right? And so Ireland and Scotland is filled with these holy wells. And during the period of pilgrimage, which essentially was Chaucer's era, um, a lot of pilgrims started going to these wells and leaving offerings. And the church knew this, and they set up churches and monasteries and convents to collect the offerings. Uh, and this got to be such a big business that the King of England, about the 800s, passed a decree that made it illegal to do holy pilgrimages, to do pilgrimages to holy wells, which made it only all the more attractive. Right? But there's a problem, okay? So let's say that, uh, that, that Professor Wilkov comes to me and says, I have been to the holy well in New Haven, and I, I, br I brought back this, this holy water. And I say, sure, 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 you just got it from the stream behind your hovel, right? How, how, did, how is he gonna prove to me that he actually got holy water from Yale uh, and, not, and not from his backyard? A bottle. So what, the, what would happen at these holy wells is they would basically create these kilns. And the kilns would have these special flasks that had a stamp. And so he, he can't prove to me the water came from Yale. He can't prove to me the flask came from Yale. It's a bit like Mickey Mouse ears, right? So this basically is from around the 500s from Athens, a holy, um, a holy well in Athens. And it's the old, it is the oldest example we have of branded packaging. Right, so this is kind of the precursor to, to all these other things. All right, so I will, I will stop there. We've got about five or 10 minutes, I think, if folks have any questions. Thanks. Questions for Jim Salzman. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the impact of melting glaciers on water supplies in such places as 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll, it's, it's climate change more generally, right? So um, obviously, th th we have the same amount of water on Earth as we've always had and we always will have, right? We're, we're a closed system. So one of the aspects of climate change is not more or less water. It's just more extremes in some areas and in others. Um, the melting glaciers are an issue. The bigger issue for access to water is not the melting glaciers. It's that more water is falling as rain than as snow used to be. And so what's happening, and if we see this in the Sierras, you see it in the Himalayas as well, is that basically the rainfall is basically rushing off very quickly. And there's not the physical infrastructure to capture a lot of it. When it fell as snow, basically the glaciers would meter out the snow melt over the season. And so there's a huge concern right now, particularly in the Himalayas, and California also, but we've got quite a bit of infrastructure. But in the Himalayas, there's an enormous concern about what's going to happen after the month, a few months after the monsoons. Uh, you know, after, after all the rain has fallen, when you don't have as much snowpack that's releasing the water. Now, the question, you know, for drinking water, th th that's, that's a huge issue for agriculture. It's less of an issue for drinking water in the sense that drinking water is a tiny percentage of, of the water that we actually consume as a society. That said, I'm sure you're all familiar with Cape Town, right? They actually have added a new term to the global vocabulary called day zero, right? That term didn't exist until a few years ago, Cape Town's a very advanced city, right? And they came within six weeks of basically shutting off all private faucets in the, in the city. Um, they got a respite, but they're going to they're gonna get there again. Um, Barcelona, right? A few years ago, they had to bring in tanker water from Marseille. Uh, and so there's a huge challenge going forth about how these big cities are becoming increasingly urbanized are going to ensure access to safe drinking water. So where I live in Santa Barbara, they built a desalination plant. Um, and desal you know, can be an answer, but it's problematic in part because it's expensive, uses a lot of energy. You've got brine you've got to get rid of. The main reason it's problematic, though, is that, as I said, water is very heavy and it's expensive to move. If you're along a coast, that's fine. If you're over a big aquifer that's saline, that's fine. But if you're inland, uh, desal is not going to help you. All right, so this is sort of one of, the, one of the huge challenges, is how do we ensure enough drinking water going forward? And climate change is really, you know, is really driving a lot of that. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I just have a couple quick questions about American drinking water, because um, I'm a physician, I'm not a medical specialist, and I see a lot of what I see epidemiologically. Yeah. MCLs, yeah. Correct. 91 chemicals. And we have over, what, 90,000 industrial chemicals that are currently available and getting to our water system potentially. Right. And they are at levels of sometimes parts per million, parts per trillion. There's a huge body of evidence on end and it's right. destructing chemicals that right. are at the level of parts per billion, parts per million, parts per trillion, including the PFOAs, which now are pretty much everywhere. So I just wanted to ask you, Right. I'm just curious about what your thoughts are with the energy structure. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question, and it's, it's a hard question. Right, so just to be clear, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, they're sometimes called uh, hormone mimics. They basically are these synthetic compounds that have very similar chemical structure to human hormones. Um, and so there are uh, Lake Opalka in, in Florida. There are a few places where there are these high concentrations of endocrine disruptors in the natural system and you get fish with three eyes. I mean, I'm not sure about fish with three eyes, but you get all kinds of, all kinds of problems. Um, and so, as I said before, those and a bunch of other things are in our drinking water. Um, and I, I, I think it comes down to um, sort of two issues. One issue is cost, right? We could certainly take those things out of our drinking water, but it's at a price no one politically is willing to pay, right? So it's the Safe Drinking Water Act, not the Pure Drinking Water Act. Um, the second problem is we don't have, and you'll know this from your own work, we don't have clear epidemiological evidence um, that this is actually having, having an impact, right? And so it's, it's as much a political issue as it is a public health issue. Uh, and so uh, in PFOA, PFAS, you mentioned, these are uh, a new class of compounds that everyone's focusing on at the moment uh, as well, including Professor Jaffe. Um, 
And so I, I think the question basically is, uh, and what I write about in the book, uh, is the extent to which we're, we're going to become not just consumers of water, but basically civic actors in the water space. Uh, there's no question we as citizens could say to our, you know, could say to our drinking water utilities and, and, and the boards that oversee them, we want you to take these things out, move close to reverse osmosis, but the price of our water would go way up. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is, in, in when you don't have clear epidemiological evidence, what do you do? And I think the question, the answer has to be public education. And, you know, that, that really hasn't done much recently, but ultimately I think it has to be a political decision when there's no science, when there's not strong, a strong scientific signal one way or the other. But it, it, it is a challenge for sure. You know, it, it, it turns out if you look across the world, we're more stringent in some areas. Europe is more stringent than others. There's no, air, there's no country that is more stringent across the board than the U.S. It just depends on what it is you're talking about. Yeah, is that your question? Can we see in some countries around the world moving toward water markets? For example, Murray-Darling Basin in yeah. Australia. And kind of translating that, I'd like to get your take on this, but kind of translating that approach to the United States where we have these two very distinctly different systems. We have in the West, we have the prior appropriation states, right? That first and right, first to water. Right. And then here in the, in the eastern part of the United States, we have this riparian perspective on you know, how, we, how we have rights to water. And they're very different. And so I kind of wonder if you see the market system that they have in other places in the world as being a application to like the Colorado River, which is one of the most overutilized systems in the world, yet it's still in under that prior appropriation doctrine. What's kind of I yeah, so, so I teach an entire course on that very question. Okay, so, so, <laughs> so, so I'll give you a, a two minute, two minutes. So, so, yeah, so, um, so the, the, uh, we basically, um, we manage water using, in the West, which is where scarcity is a bigger issue, we manage water using a scheme that was developed in mining camps in the 1870s, right? It was never designed for our current situation. And so what I like to say when I teach the class on water law is we're essentially trying to eat soup with a fork. Right? We are operating a very suboptimal mean, uh, a way of dealing with things. Because of prior appropriation, essentially the first farmers who began using a lot of water in the West, they have rights to all this water in these cities that grew up afterwards where the water is economically much more valuable. They don't have access to the water. And you would think, well, that's easy. We'll just let the farmers sell the water to the cities. The law makes that very difficult. And the reason was that um, the notion of water uh, of, of water law in the West was if you don't use all the water, you are wasting it, right? And so the idea was uh, no water should actually reach the coast. That was, that was the ideal situation in early, in early water law in the West, which in many respects is still, is still the water law we have today. Uh, and so essentially what you have to do is come up with these incredibly uh, convoluted legal structures in order to lease water and to move water back and forth. The, uh, the, the, the short answer to your question, then I probably, we can talk afterwards, um, is that when you reach a crisis point, then you get major changes. So well, I, I moved to California in 2015, and people said no way in their lifetimes would they ever see groundwater effectively managed in California. Right? Essentially, it was just pump as much as you want. The Central Valley has already sunk 28 feet uh, since 1900, right? and that's just from, just from overpumping. In the sixth year of the drought, a new law was passed called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act that says by 2030, we'll have sustainable management of groundwater. Maybe yes, maybe no, but that's a, that's a seismic change. And I think in answer to your question, right now markets are extremely unwieldy and expensive and difficult. We're out of the drought now, but we're gonna have another drought. There's no question about that. And in the depths of the next drought, I wouldn't at all be surprised to see the laws changed. To make, to make trading much, more, much easier, but it'll take major legal changes and it'll take paying off farmers who have the water rights. That's what happened in Australia, is the government spent $3 billion paying off farmers in order to, to do this, and that system apparently seems to have crashed. It's uh, not doing as well as they had hoped. That's a polite way of <laughs> saying it. Anyway, so David told me we have to end at one, so I will. So we oh. take one more question from the audience. What? What? Uh, is there a question? Otherwise, uh, 
<laughs> we talked earlier about everybody having out there bottle of water. Yeah. And and it's under the perception in Rome that, that it's it's safe. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, great question. So um uh, Fiji water. They had an ad campaign a few years ago that said it's called Fiji water because it's not from Cleveland, which I thought was pretty harsh, actually. So, so what Cleveland did, bless, bless their soul, is they sponsored research that did chemical assays of 30 different bottled waters compared to Cleveland water. And they found that a third of the bottled waters were not as clean as Cleveland's municipal water. Um, here, here's the fact. The fact is that Drinking water, tap water, is regulated by the EPA under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Extremely rigorous testing requirements. Flint was basically, they, they cheated. But if you don't cheat, it's extremely rigorous. Bottled water is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And if the bottled water does not cross state lines, it's regulated by the state. And most states don't regulate bottled water. Uh, and so, you know, if you want to drink bottled water because you think it's safer and you have a reason to doubt your own water if you're in Flint, great. If you, think, if you drink bottled water because you think it's better for you than your tap water in Princeton, New Jersey, God bless, right? But, but it's not, uh, there's no reason to think that it's, uh, that it's any safer. So there's more to say, but that's the, the, the bottom line. There are reasons to drink bottled water, but b b being safer than tap water in a place like this is, is not one of them. Well, All right. Oops. Jim, thank you so much. Really appreciate it.